Kia ora and welcome to the Niggly Niche cast. I'm the Diggly Dude Dad, Dr. Peptoy Panther. Mr. Louis Slippers is in the house. He had to bowl a couple of doosers to the wildcard who will probably misread them off the pitch because I'm a unorthodox spinner. And you may have guessed we are here to talk through Black Caps Test Cricket. They are about to start their first test uh, of the Test Series versus Sri Lanka in Sri Lanka and also the first test of the Test Championship. So we're going to talk specifically about the Black Caps first test versus Sri Lanka with the wild card. You know the deal, support the Niche Cage on Patreon. That's the best way to support us directly, straight up the guts. Otherwise, just like, comment, subscribe, rate, review. Let us know that you're out there listening. We appreciate it. Appreciate the love and all the feedback. So big it up to yous. And just keep helping us do what we do and provide this content. Um, you know, we can't do it without y'all. So hit us up, support us, and we'll keep serving it up for yous. Wildcard. It feels like the football season has just started. Like, um, how are you? And does, like, a football off-season exist? Does a football off-season exist? I would say, I mean, first of all, I'd say I'm pretty bloody tired after watching... Uh, I only got through the three Premier League games on the weekend, but, you know, it, just, it takes it out of you um, one, each, one each day as well, which was nice. So yeah, nah. There's definitely a there's definitely a uh, an off season for the football. It's called transfer windows, and it it goes pretty wild for a while there. But there's there's certainly like, I mean, there's no break in uh, coverage. There's no break in headlines. It's no break in just hype and and energy and all this. But there's certainly that sort of nag and feeling that the football. You know, there's only so many uh, fake and misleading transfer stories you can you can get your head around until you get to the point where it's like, man, I just want to see balls being kicked towards goals. I want to see slide tackles. I want to see like guys challenging for headers. I want to see the good stuff again. And that's that's pretty much where the football has been for at least a month um, after I'd say after the Women's World Cup when you had that big old sort of drought where. Yeah, it's, it's it's fun. It's enjoyable watching the speculation, especially for someone like myself who gets to, um, you know, try figure out what's real, sort the good from the bad and the wild from the completely fake. And but yeah, no, nah, there's they, they got a while. It got grinding there for a while, mate. It got grinding having to wait for the actual football, which has finally, thankfully, uh, blessedly returned to us. Just quickly, what's your like? Do you have like one player that you're most interested in? outside of the flying kiwis uh spectrum like is there a team or a player predominantly i guess in england or maybe elsewhere in europe who you're just like most interested in watching and observing how they go well it's probably be cheating of myself to say someone from manchester united even though it would also be true i'm gonna chuck an interesting one out here um moise kane from Juventus signed with Everton this offseason, which is a weird transfer for many, many, many reasons. He's like, I think, 19 years old. He's played a few times for Italy. Got a run in the Juventus team playing as a striker towards the end of last season. Scored a bunch of goals. Looks like an absolutely fantastic like prospect and already a pretty incredible player. But for some reason, he has left Juventus and signed for Everton, which feels like a bit of a, like... I don't, I don't think you can say it's a lack of ambition. I think it's kind of the opposite. It's super brave. It's gambling on yourself to say, like, well, I'm playing at a club here where there are a lot of guys in front of me in the picking order. I can't expect, you know, regular game time here. Here's a club that will not only pick me but and not only pay the fee to sign me but also will, you know, uh, let me play a lot of games. He, I mean, he's he's a super exciting player, but it's it's weird from a Juventus standpoint that they sold one of their best young players, certainly their best young forward at the moment. But, I mean, you've got Ronaldo there, so there's only so much game time to pass around. I assume they must have like a, a buyback clause or something like that. It's normally what they do when Italian clubs sell, you know, prospects like that. But it's a, it's a funky one for a lot of different reasons because it's just Juventus to Everton for a player who's actually a top prospect and expected to improve. It's not one you expect normally. I think part of it, uh, for, for Kane at least, is that being a uh, being an Italian guy of African origin, he cops a lot from the old Italian ultras in ways that um, 
well, you know, put it bluntly, getting racially abused every week by the away fans. And uh, yeah, it's not the most tolerable place to be Italian football. So I, I can see why uh, he d decided to do what he's done. I can see why Everton had taken a punt. I don't really understand it from a Juventus point of view, but yeah, it's certainly a fella to keep an eye out because he, he could be something special and the kind of guy who could lift a team like Everton up to, to maybe push for that sixth spot, you know? There we have it. That's a nice little teaser for our upcoming football podcast, which we oh, hope to record it? on Wednesday. So uh, there'll definitely in that podcast there'll definitely be a much bigger flying Kiwis and uh, Aotearoa influence in there. But wild card talks footy, you never know where it's going to go. We are going to go over to Sri Lanka, figuratively and in our imaginations. One day to... we'll be able to afford it. Yeah, one day, one day. Uh, this Sri Lanka versus Aotearoa Black Caps Test Series. And Wildcard, I just want to set the scene because in my research of Sri Lanka, I found out that they went to South Africa and played two tests and won the Test Series 2-0 against South Africa in South Africa. After coming to Aotearoa in our summer and uh, getting touched up by the Black Caps, they... There's a couple interesting players that i just want to introduce here as well sri lanka have four spinners in their squad um and i just like how crick info has described them they've got a lefty orthodox spinner so just a mitchell santner ajaz patel type in lasith embaldania and he is notable because he is 22 years old he's played two tests and he averaging 23, which is pretty bloody handy. They have an older guy, uh, Lakshan Sandakan, who is a bit older, 28 years old, and he is averaging 34, so that's kind of lame. Who cares about him? Then they have a quote-unquote mystery spinner, Akila Dananyaya, and he is also very young. He is 25 years old, he's played 5 test match, and he's averaging 24. And I wouldn't be surprised if those two younger spinners are selected to play uh, alongside an established, kind of settled off-spinning all-rounder in Dananyaya Di Silva, who played in the World Cup uh, for Sri Lanka. And I talk about those, those spinners because this is kind of where this test series and this first test is going to be focused in on and i am gonna ask sit uh start here wildcard by asking you what you uh what are your hopes of the kiwi batsman in this first test knowing that they played that warm-up game against a sri lankan president board 11 but the Black Caps didn't bat in that game. They only played on day one of three days. The second and third days were washed out. So the Black Caps hadn't, haven't had ex actual any game preparation, batting-wise. And now they're coming up against the Sri Lankan team. Like, there's always drama around Sri Lankan cricket. They fired their coach last week. Um, they've recalled... Dinesh Chandamao and Angelo Matthews is back in the test squad so there's always some uh, bullshit going on in terms of shenanigans with Sri Lankan cricket are you like how are you feeling about this challenge that the Black Caps batsmen are going to face against a Sri Lankan team that does have some fairly talented spinners by the look of it and they're playing in Sri Lankan conditions as well it's definitely an underrated, um, you know, challenge that the Black Caps are facing, isn't it? Because Sri Lanka are not a team that's been set in the world alight. But like you said, they've had, they have sneakily had some very good results recently, and certainly in their home conditions, they're going to be more than a test for the for the Black Caps here. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess if you can handle their spinners, you'll probably be able to handle their pace guys because it's not like they have a Chimin Devas at the moment. Um, you know someone like that to just you know take those early wickets or whatever so and it seems like based on the way the black caps have assessed things and the way you know they've picked four spinners themselves so it certainly seems like spin is gonna be the focus who have we got who plays spin really well in our team well kane williamson and ross taylor are high on that list i think um 
Tom Latham on the basis of having an excellent sweep shot tends to be pretty handy against the spinners himself. So I guess if you're in relatively um, unfam uh, unfamiliar, I mean there there was always unfamiliar conditions when it's foreign conditions. So if you're having if you're up against it against a team who is going to be a little more confident than you realize he's going to be, you know, I don't think the Black Caps are going to take Sri Lanka lightly. So I I think we can expect pretty decent games. I think you just fall back on your your best players to be able to score you the runs and. I suspect, especially now that we've seen that weather conditions can be a little bit tropical at the moment, we're not going to be talking about big, big scores, so just get the runs that you need and hope your bowlers can do the rest of it, so uh, yeah, you just need a couple good contributions to be able to do that. A hundred or two from Williamson and Taylor along the way probably do the trick, I think that's more or less where I'm leaning for this, for this test series. It'd be nice to see some of those more fringe, not fringe, but just like the less, um, the less storied guys get some good runs. G. Raval's still waiting his first test century. Um, Colin de Gronholm's a guy who you never quite know if he's on his, you know, last stretch of rope for this team or if he's just a lot more stable than you expect. The whoever, whichever all-rounder spinner plays as well, whether it's Santner or Todd Astor or both of them, neither of them have been, um, you know, you know, no one to score bulk runs in test level yet or borderline at any level. Um, Sanders had a couple flashes now and then throughout his career. So, like, a lot of these guys would be very nice to see them get contributions, but for the Black Caps, yeah, I just think you're, you're leaning on your best players to give you the best results when it's a, this kind of um, this kind of test series coming up. Yeah, I am. That is an area of concern for me is just how the Black Caps adapt and adjust because they're coming off a World Cup. They haven't played Test cricket for a, a couple of months now, but they also haven't played. The last time they played in super spin, spin friendly conditions was uh, the UAE against Pakistan and similar conditions in a way, but also different conditions. As you mentioned, Sri Lanka is a bit more tropical where UAE just feels more dry and yeah flat and dusty yeah so it's it's i i'm just interested in you know what difference and challenge that applies because we have to remember the black caps did go to uae and defeat pakistan um in a test series if my memory serves me correctly so based on that you should be optimistic and excited and eager to see what the black caps can do but i especially with that warm-up game being rain affected it's going to it's going to be a far bigger challenge than I think a lot of people are predicting in how the Black Caps deal with Sri Lanka's spin bowling, uh, especially as we know the Black Caps do have a habit of strug uh, struggling against spin. Also, interesting here, Wildcard. I just want to bring up the so De Silva, who is the off spinner, who is a off spinning all rounder. He played. Uh, the two tests against South Africa, and he averaged 11 with the ball. <laughs> yeah, decent. So he goes all right. He goes all right. He didn't bowl many overs, but he did average 11. The three seamers in Sri Lanka's team, you have uh, Saranga Lakmal, Lahiru Kumara, and Vishwa Fernando. So we, so we saw Lakmal and Kumara in Aotearoa over the summer. Now, in Sri Lanka, Kumara, he averages 64 with the ball in test cricket in Sri Lanka. That's one seamer. Lakmal, the experienced seamer, in Sri Lanka, he averages 53.53, which Bloody is hell. a bit crazy as well. And then you've got a young, young seamer in Vishwa Fernando, who was the leading wicket taker from that series against South Africa. He took 12 wickets at an average of 18.91. However, in Sri Lanka, he averages 34. So the three seamers for Sri Lanka all average over 30, and the two experienced seamers in Kumara and Lakmal. Kumara is not overly experienced, but he is um, does have some international experience. They both average over 40 in Sri Lanka. So based on, lo on those uh, records, there's nothing really to fear about the seam bowling department 
in Sri Lankan conditions. No, I mean, I I knew the conditions weren't going to be ideal for for seam bowling, and that's why I sort of suspect that the Black Caps might, um, you know, might just go into it with probably three seamers, but including De Gronholm. I don't think Tim Southey will play. Uh, it's depending. You never know because if there's a bit of moisture in the pitch from from some of that, um, you know, heavy rain around the country, so it, it might change things. But or if they think there's a bit of cloud cover that's going to swing the ball somewhat, um, I wouldn't rely on that. But I mean, Trent Bolt plays every single game because he's Trent Bolt, so he'll be there regardless. And Neil Wagner, I expect, although. I do happen to recall Neil Wagner struggling quite badly in that first um, OD, uh, the first test match in the UAE. So, um, like you say, slightly different conditions. Um, spin-friendly conditions both, but um, Sri Lanka versus UAE, they are different kinds of spin-friendly conditions. So maybe Neil Wagner, just for his ability to bounce a bugger out, um, Sri Lanka have tended to struggle with that kind of bowling in the past at times. And yeah, so I I suspect that's the way the Black Caps are leaning. I'm I'm kind of shocked by Suranga Lakmal's stats there in particular because he's a pretty fine bowler. He's the you know the leader of their seam bowling attack. But yeah, maybe that's just because I see him bowling on green New Zealand pitches more often than anywhere else. Because oh, 50 odd in your home country isn't fantastic, is it? No, and just to add to that wild card. Uh, this is an incredibly small sample size, so keep that in mind. But it's also, that's another note here. Uh, Neil Wagner hasn't played a test match in Sri Lanka, so we don't have any uh, record of his bowling. Trent Bolt and Tim Southey have both only played two test matches in Sri Lanka. So none of the seam bowlers are overly experienced in Sri Lankan conditions. And they are kind of our most experienced players, other than Kane Williamson and Ross Taylor. So uh, if they haven't played much cricket in Sri Lanka, no one else has. But you mentioned the high averages of the Sri Lankan seam bowlers. Uh, two tests. Tim Southey's averaging 13 with the ball against Sri Lanka in Sri Lanka. Trent Bolt, he's averaging 15 in Sri Lanka. So... <laughs> The, right. the Kiwi seamers, with an incredibly small sample size, are better in Sri Lanka than the Sri Lankan seamers are in Sri Lanka in Test Match Cricket. Yeah, and it's not even close. Yeah, both of the Kiwi seamers average under 20, where the two equivalent bowlers for Sri Lanka average over 40, which is a bit bonkers. Yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> It's completely bonkers. I don't even know, other than the small sample size aspect of it and the fact that Sri Lanka tend to, um, for someone like Lakmal in particular, he would have played a lot of his career alongside someone like Rangana Herath. And if that's the case, then, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a strike spinner around you, then they're going to be getting the bulk of the overs and maybe you're not going to be the guy who takes a lot of wickets because you're getting to spin quite soon after the new ball starts to fade a bit. So... Yeah, I don't know. It's, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know how to make sense of those stats, but um, I still I still stand by that idea that I'm not sure that Tim Southey isn't going to be made a bit of a scapegoat in order to get an extra spinner in there, which I don't think would be a terrible idea either, because you'd still have Trent Bolt if the ball does a little bit off the seam. So I mean, you you trust him to take care of business there. Ross Taylor and Kane Williamson. Um, I was going to look this up, but my computer doesn't seem to want to... Um, well, I'm worried that my computer won't be able to handle doing two things at once. So, But from memory, Ross Taylor and Kane Williamson have both scored runs in Sri Lanka before, though. So um, in the same way as a couple of our bowlers, maybe... Uh, yeah, sure, small sample size. We don't seem to tour here too often. But, I mean, Ross Taylor definitely has 100 in Sri Lanka because I remember him turning up after that whole... Um, you remember that... Uh, that that very infamous test series where Brendan McCullum and Mike Hesson somewhat staged a bit of a coup to take the captaincy off of Ross Taylor, and Ross Taylor responded by scoring 100 in a test match, and yeah, I, I, I seem to recall that happening once upon a time. Unless I dreamed it. One of the strangest episodes of Kiwi cricket history. It really is, hey, uh, it really is. Kane Williamson, I think, come on, yeah, Kane Williamson... He has played two tests in Sri Lanka, averaging 40 with the bat. Ross Taylor, he has played four tests in Sri Lanka, averaging 50 with the bat. So uh, reasonably good statistics there. Is there 100 in there for Williamson? 
uh, there is one for Ross Taylor, definitely, and there is one for Kane Williamson, yep. Because I think the stat is that Williamson scored 100 in every country he's played in or something like that in test matches, isn't it? Uh, I'm not sure if there might be like a Zimbabwe or something missing just because we probably only played there once or twice. But No, it's South Africa. He's only averaging 21 South in South Africa. He averages over 30 in every other country that he's played a test. Beautiful. Beautiful numbers. Well, except for South Africa. Except like. for South Africa. Well, you know you know where we played straight after that um, Sri Lanka game was they went to South Africa with Brendan McCullum as captain. Ross Taylor took a mental health break and didn't go on that tour. And famously, we were bowled out for 45 in one of those innings. And well, I, I looked at the scorecard not that long ago, I, I, but I it's long enough that I can't remember it um, picture perfect. But... I have a suspicion that Kane Williamson top scored in that innings too with like 10 or 12 or something like that. Big dog. But yeah, one, people uh, can probably look that one up on their own. Ross Taylor's lowest average is also in South Africa. He averages 7 in South Africa. Yikes. Mate, there's, 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 there's trends all over the show here. Um, you mentioned Tim Southey, so that's where I think the, the crux of this discussion around the Black Caps first test against Sri Lanka in Sri Lanka uh, will be is the makeup of the bowling all-rounder unit. So we kind of know Jeet Raval, Tom Latham, Kane Williamson, Ross Taylor, Tom Latham, uh, Henry Nichols, Henry sorry, Nichols, yeah. and then BJ Watling. So that's the top six. Like I don't think anyone is going to argue with those six players holding on to their spots in the batting lineup. I, I'm i leaning towards, you know, selecting Mitchell Santner ahead of Colin de Gronholm, and I would play Mitchell Santner, Will Somerville, and Ajaz Patel. So you would have Mitchell Santner batting number seven. How would you tinker with that? Uh, do, you, do you have Santner... Patel and Somerville as your spinning uh, group? Like, how are you viewing the makeup of the bowling unit? Uh, well, yeah, my, my suspicion is that Tim Southey won't play. I think that's just a little bit of a trend that they've been sort of leaning on in recent times when someone has to drop out. It's become Southey as the guy who uh, is no longer unconditional because that's Trent Bolt. And I think. Wagner just fulfills a different a different sort of role in the in the team. So I suspect you get those two. I still think Colin de Gronholm plays because if Saudi doesn't play, de Gronholm will just to be the other opening bowler, just to be someone who can get through some overs and might give you something special with the bat now and then if you if you need something like that. So there's three fellas locked in. And what does that leave you? Two spinners. So I I think the way that they're leaning is the same thing I said when they picked the squad. I think it's a battle, like two little one-on-ones. I think you've got a spinning all-rounder and a and just a straight-ahead spinner. But So you've got Santner versus Astor for one spot, and you've got Somerville versus Patel for one spot. You might like want to get really funky and drop Wagner and pick you know, three of them. Take, say we're going to take Patel and Somerville, and also one of Santner or Astor. And... Yeah, I think I think your leaning is probably the same as where the Black Caps would go as well. I think Santner is ahead of Astor in that situation. I wonder if he should be. I wonder if maybe having a leg spinner in these conditions who can turn the ball a little bit more. Um, Todd Astor is in a prodigious turner, but as we know, uh, you know, Mitch Santner isn't really a turner of the ball at all. So. You know, I'm just a little bit suspicious that Todd Astor might not be a slightly better option compared directly to... Because that's the thing, we often compare Astor's selection to East Sodi's because they're both leg spinners. But in this particular situation, I don't think, you know, it would have anything to do with that. I think he's directly up against Mitchell Santner. And yeah, I think that's a funky one to watch out for because Gary Stead does like his... Like all Cantabrians, he does like other Cantabrians. So I wonder if that might... Uh, you know, give him a little bit of a nudge. Also, there's that story about how um, the selection team 
tried so hard to get Todd Astle in for the World Cup, and then at the end, supposedly Cam Williams said, "Guys, we're o-, Cam Williamson said, guys, we're overthinking this. Just pick East Sodi because he's a better bowler, and that's what happened." So I wonder if Cam Williamson, who you know, kind of famously, um, Cam Williamson is a very nice guy, so I'm not suggesting any kind of rift here, but. He's a very clever cricketer as well, and quite famously, as we've spoken about a few times, he he doesn't always give, even when Todd Astle plays, he doesn't always give him the overs. So uh, there's a little bit of a underground theory that maybe he doesn't trust him as much. So I still think Santner will play, but I wonder if Astle might be slightly better for the conditions. I'm not going to cry either way about it. And I think Somerville is just because Sri Lanka are going to have a few left-handers. I think Somerville is ahead of Patel. But that's where this get, gets um, funky, isn't it? Because... Ajaz Patel took five wickets in that in that um, warm-up game. He was the only player of any note to get through, um, you know, to, to do anything notable in that game because, of, you know, for New Zealand because of the fact that those other two days were rained off. He took five for, I think, Somerville got a wicket near the end. Both of those two bowled a lot of overs. From memory, Santner and Astle didn't hardly bowl anything, so that was a bit notable as well. So if you want to pick up based on, you know, form and the fact that Patel, when they last played in those spin-friendly conditions, Patel was the hero in the UAE, I, yeah, I, I wonder how they're going to go about this because I think that is your number one um, selection dilemma here is which spinners? And is there a situation where they might take Patel and Somerville and not pick Santner or Astor? Or is there a situation where they pick three spinners and only two seamers? Um, they do have Kane Williamson can get through some overs as an off-spinner, so maybe that counts against Somerville. So I, I think there's a lot of balancing going on here that's going to be really interesting when they when they name the team come uh, come time for the toss. If we are talking about what you've done in Sri Lanka, Todd Astle is averaging 97 with the ball in Sri Lanka. One test, one test, so... so. You know, but he yeah just, he debuted there, didn't he? Like yeah, that six, that, seven that, years ago. that 2012 series I think was the was the Todd Astle debut. Yeah, that that same series, wasn't it? What do you know? Another pattern. Just looking at that warm up game, uh, you had Bolt, Southey, and Wagner. They all bowled nine overs each, which I believe would have been completely intentional. And then you had. Will Somerville and Ajaz Patel bowled at least 10 overs. Will Somerville 13, Ajaz Patel 10. And Mitchell Santner didn't take a wicket, but he was the most economical of all the Kiwi bowlers in that game. He bowled six overs, conceding just 3.16 runs per over, and no other Kiwi bowler conceded less than four runs and over. And then Todd Astle, he also bowled six overs, but he conceded 6.66 runs per over. So Todd Astor was the least effective Kiwi spinner. He was the most expensive, and he also didn't take a wicket. Mitchell Santner kind of being true to form, perhaps the most not, not the most threatening spinner, but very economical, very tidy. And then, as you said, Ajaz Patel took the wickets. He took five at 4.1 runs per over, and Will Somerville took his wicket at 5.06 runs per over. Sri Lanka as a team, they scored at 4.9 runs per over. So they basically just had fun with the Black Caps bowling attack and Colin de Gronholm bowled three overs conceding eight runs and over as the most expensive Kiwi bowler in that warm-up game. Very young Colin, isn't it? Yes, but I think... By the looks of things, how that Sri Lankan team batted in that game, I don't think you can single out like one bowler. I think it was just a dissection of the Kiwi bowlers in general, apart from Ajaz Patel. Yeah, and he did take Ajaz did take five wickets, so it's not like they were doing it without, um, you know, without copping a few blows back in the in the process. They weren't just go out there pummeling four hundred for two or whatever. So yeah, that, that's that's funky because I think Patel coming into this series. The fact that they picked, and you know, one of the notable absentees on this tour is Ish Sodi, who always seems to get mentioned in terms of selection um, unluckiness. But the way that they picked the team was that the, you know they wanted four spinners out of the five Test match spinners that they have currently available, and they based it just pretty much on 
you know, what have you done for me lately kind of thing. Who was in the pecking order? Santa was already there, missed a lot of time from injury, but, you know, held his place sort of like in the boxing, um, the when they they still keep the lineal champion after you're... Um, after you've if you know if you've had to give up the belt because of injury or whatever like that that kind of situation um Somerville and Patel had played more recently Astor had played more recently and that was sort of the way that they went with it but I think based on that logic I think but Ajaz Patel probably would have been the fourth spinner but he was the best performing one in this tour match and how much um you know how much trust you want to put in a tour match especially when it seems like Sri Lanka or the Sri Lankan 11 rather we're out there just sort of having a bit of a hit and giggle you know how much faith you want to put in that game and the performances from that when it was clearly a bit of a warm-up based on how you know, first of all all 15 players were available so everyone got a bowl that needed a bowl that day so uh, you know it's not exactly um test match conditions and it seems like they're just running through overs to get people just their reps and the and the situation and all that but that could be pretty influential in terms of how they pick the team, in terms of what decisions they make based on these sort of two or three kind of kind of funky, unwritten aspects that we've got to try to figure out here. How much would you put it? Like, well, how much would you trust a, a tour match like that? Do you think Ajaz has played himself into the team, or do you think he's sort of, um, you know, uh, n well done, but uh, we're waiting to see how other things go. We still prefer what we were thinking here, assuming that's what they were thinking anyway, but... I think in this context, it is kind of important because you can say whatever you want to say, but I think generally across the board, all the spinners from Aotearoa, including East Sodi, are on a fairly even keel. Like I don't think one stands head and shoulders, apart from Will Somerville being a tall keen. <laughs> uh, I, like, I don't think there is a dominant spinner in Aotearoa. Now, everyone is going to have their personal preferences. As I come to think of it, that was a lot of my discussion over the summer was how the Kiwi spin situation is just purely up to who you like as a person because statistically and eye testly, they're all fairly similar in how effective they are and, and their strengths and weaknesses. Like, no one is dominant over the other. And for me, that's the most interesting storyline in general about this test series in Sri Lanka is which spinner is going to command selection moving forward because, yeah, like, uh, I think we both prefer to invest time and resource into East Sodi, but, like... No, none of these spinners have really true blue taken their opportunities and and uh, fought off the challenges of the other spinners over a long, consistent period of time. Granted, some of that is due to uh, retarded selections and just a complete lack of consistency and solidarity in who you're going to select as the, as the as the dominant spinner. But also, part of that is due to um, none of the spinners really commanding future selections. And because of that, I think Ajaz Patel's performance in the warm-up game does give him a little edge. And I do, if I was to rank based on uh, the context of everything and how it sits now, Ajaz Patel should be the first spinner selected in that test squad because he was the, the bloke who took five wickets in a warm-up game in that country. And I do put... Uh, as you're asking me, I do put a fair amount of weight on that performance, but that is because of this greater narrative where we have a whole bunch of spinners, but no one really wants to be the number one spinner as of yet. And if we're looking forward to the rest of the Test Championship, we need to find a top dog spinner. And it's great to know we have other spinners maybe for I think they go to Bangladesh at some point in the test championship so you'll need another spinner there and you obviously need competition for places you need a you need backups in case of injury and all that stuff so you need three four five spinners in your uh, pool of players but this is an opportunity in spin friendly conditions for someone to say, yo, I'm going to be here as the main spinner. I'm better than the rest of you dudes. 
I'm going to take wickets for New Zealand in Test cricket, and I'm going to contribute to wins. And the Black Caps aren't just going to be a team that uh, dominates through sp uh, seam bowling. I'm going to be a factor in Test cricket as a spinner. And I just want to see who takes on that uh, responsibility and that that uh, hunger to be the best. Are you bringing up your your summer's talking point of the spinners being on an even keel and it just sort of being a bit of personal preference there from selection wise? You gave me a little bit of flashbacks to recording in the shed outside during summer, but because um, I've since moved inside because my Wi-Fi isn't that strong out there. But yeah, you gave me flashbacks to back then when we we're doing the podcast at the start of the year. <laughs> That was a little bit of a funky out of body moment there, but yeah, no, nah, it's it's completely true though, isn't it? It's like that's that's the that's the issue here is that we've got a nice little selection of spinners, but no one who's really just consistently demanded that kind of selection. And the the reason Ajaz fell to the back of the queue was because after bowling outstandingly well in the UAE, he came home and had a bad one in New Zealand conditions, and that's unlucky for him it's a bit unfair as well i thought at the time even though it was pretty much just based on you know a singular um test match kind of situation but i mean the way the test championship is going to work over the next couple of years well the next what 20 to 24 months or however whenever i'm not sure exactly the scheduling but like we obviously are going to play half our games at home so if you're if you're a guy who bowls really well in these foreign spinning conditions but aren't taking wickets in home test matches obvious caveat here being the fact that Ajaz Patel consistently albeit with um by bowling a bulk of wickets it's not like his strike rate super high but he consistently takes wicket at Plunkett Shield levels so um the idea that he's not a great bowler in New Zealand conditions is a complete fallacy but it might be a factor that others are just a little more effective within the basis of this team for New Zealand conditions when we are going to build the bowling attack around our seam bowlers so whether he can command selection in New Zealand conditions is going to be interesting because that's those New Zealand conditions don't have much to do with these Sri Lankan conditions and that's why this is so much fun to focus on the spinners here because to be honest like yeah there is that towards the Bangladesh tour towards the end of the test championship I think it's in um uh, is it next August or something? It might be in a year's time or something like that, or maybe a little later, I'm not sure. But around that time, sort of later year, next year, that's really the only... Like, we play India at home. I think we have Pakistan at home as well. That's, like, that's... That's really the only time, the only other time we're going to be bowling in this kind of spin-friendly conditions. Over the rest of the summer, we're playing in New Zealand against England. We're playing in New Zealand against... Uh, is it India or is it Pakistan or someone like that later on in the on start of next year? In between, we're playing in Australia. This is the time for the spinners to shine, and this is really the only chance that these guys are going to get because we're not going to be, you know, we're not even going to be considering bowling three spinners in a um, in a test match for uh, up until that Bangladesh series, if even then, because. Uh, they might just decide that I'll, you know, first of all, someone might have come along by then and just said, you know, any one of those five spinners, I'll say five because I don't think if Sodi's out of the reckoning at all, you know, one of those guys could have come in and said, nah, I am your number one spinner. You're picking me every test match and this is the way we're doing it um, for the by the time of that Bangladesh series. So really, this is such an opportunity for these spinners that it just isn't for others like... Kane Williamson's out there trying to win test matches, score runs like he always does. Same with most of them. But these spinners are, in a way, like for for Todd Astle, for AJ Patel, and for Will Somerville in particular, you could argue they're kind of playing for their test futures in a way because these are all guys who are around, you know, 30 years of age or older. I think it's a really, really funky... Um, just series for this for the spinners in particular and just for so many different ways and it's really the only aspect of this play caps team other than the fact that they've got to go and win these games and put points on the board in the test championship it's really the only aspect that's gonna like linger and it's gonna linger in a funny way because these conditions aren't going to be replicated so even the guy who dominates if one of them does in this series might not you know might not play another test this summer so it's it's yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be weird. It's gonna be in, really interesting to see how they balance that idea and um, coming back to New Zealand afterwards and going to Australia and probably gonna fall back on 
one spinner in those kind of situations, and I tend to think that they're going to lean towards someone like Mitchell Santner, who I suspect might be the least effective bowling in these conditions against Sri Lanka. So, yeah, weird times. Good times to be a spinner, though. What was your over under on? Window uh, of good time. But... What was your over under on the amount of tests Will Somerville will play in his career? Uh, I believe the exact bet was my over under was under zero point five deliveries bowled in the rest of his test career. But I'm I'm you know I'm happy to cash out on that one now if you'll let me because I think he's going to play this test match. Yeah, yeah, um, but I I, <laughs> I yeah I do. I'm wearing egg on my face from that one. No, nah, but I do agree that you know after this test series there might not be a whole lot in the futures of one two maybe three of those uh spinners so very interesting times as you have alluded to we'll wrap it up there wild card and i'll be back to do a rugby league podcast tomorrow then we'll come back for the football one on wednesday we're going to record our second patreon only uh podcast just talking a bunch of wider broader interesting topics that tickle our taste buds and then We'll see how we go from there. Otherwise, tune in. I think this test starts on Wednesday night. I believe so. Wednesday evening, I think. I'm not sure the exact time zones there. I think Sri Lanka is a good time. Like it's like dinner time. Yeah, start. nice, nice evening sort of sessions. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So we'll I'll find out in a second. Well, we'll finish the podcast before then. Yeah, we'll... now nah, people can look it up themselves. My phone's not going to work that quickly right yeah so take care care cars stay beautiful and we'll catch you uh next time 4 30 p.m on wednesday <laughs>